I'm delighted to be here with you and uh, share some ideas and basically what I'm going to share with you is our long journey, an ongoing journey actually, about solidarity and sisterhood and how this leads to economic empowerment and some self-reliance of some of the poorest of our citizens, the women workers of this country who are in the informal economy. Transporting you to the world of work in India, uh, perhaps many of you know these figures. I'm just curious, how many of you knew that 93% of India's workforce is informal? Oh, you are a pretty informed audience, I must say. Um, but perhaps you didn't know that the contribution to our country's GDP is more than 50% and 55% of national savings and about 47% of exports as well. And if we look at the female workforce in this country, about 94% are informal. They are like my seva sister Raji Ben Chavra there, who's from a small village in Viramgam, Taluka of Ahmedabad district, about an hour and a half uh, away from the big hub of the city of Ahmedabad. As you can see, she's a small farmer. Uh, she grows cotton. She's very worried this year with the lack of rain. And that's how her life is, full of insecurity, no security of work or income, which means no regular work and income, and very little social security, which is at least health care in our experience, child care, insurance, pension, access to financial services, a little bit improved now with Jandhan Yojana and some of the government schemes, but still a long way to go. Compared to 43 years ago when Seva and the Seva movement started, there has been progress, but still large number of women like Rajiben have no voice, very little visibility, um, and remain for the most part uncounted, undercounted, certainly their unpaid work at home, their care work is uncounted and undervalued. What we've noticed over the years is that the overlap between informality, poverty, and gender, again, it comes to, as no surprise to all of you, a very informed audience, that the women of this country get the worst work. In fact, it's often work that men will not do, most hazardous work. And also they face, of course, gender discrimination within their families, um, in their communities and in society at large. Um, you're probably aware, I remember at the beginning of the UN Decade of Women, the statistics that uh, came out on women's contribution to the world of work. Two thirds of still of all the world's work is done by women, but they only get 10% of income and we get less than 1% of ownership of property like land and, and so on. Um, what are the kinds of trades that women like Raji Ben and her sisters at Seva are involved in? They are manual laborers and service providers. As you can see in the photograph, women who are harvesting tobacco. In fact, most of the tobacco industry uh, is, is the production from planting right to rolling beeries on the other photograph is all done by women. So manual laborers and service providers like domestic workers, construction work, the first slide you saw women carrying bricks on their head, street vendors who we all know, a very lively uh, bunch in our urban economy, home-based workers like the beady workers you see in the photograph there, and small producers. So here are these women through their labor, through their work, 24 by 7, no sick leave, no weekly day off, no maternity benefits, no daycare, no basic access to health care. But through their labor, uh, pumping income into the economy, local economy, um, state economies, and even national economy. And the injustice of it all is what moved the founder of Seva, Ila Bhatt, to form Seva way back 43 years ago. Today, perhaps, building women's solidarity and women's groups, self-help groups, doesn't seem like a big deal. But 43 years ago, bringing women together and poor women together, women at the grassroots together on a common platform, was definitely a novel idea, an idea fraught with obstacles. 
I remember that the labor movement where Seva was born, the Textile Labor Association, they laughed and they said, are these working women? This is just a hobby. They're doing this to pass the time. And when we went to register our organization, um, again, the registrar was confused. He said, what, what is this bunch of women? I mean, where are the husbands was his first question. So in 1972, Ila Bhatt then decided to form an organization of the women themselves, a membership-based organization, a national union. And today it has grown to about 1.9 million, that's about 19 lakhs, and as you can see in 14 states of the country. Some are small organizations, like in Nagaland we have just 500 members now, and others like in Gujarat where the Seva story and the Seva movement began are over 10 lakhs. So it's a work in progress, it's a journey. Each of the Sevas are autonomous and quite self-reliant. There's no sort of control or franchise sort of approach. I think what I'd like to share is also that it isn't one large sort of humongous organization, but the approach has been to set up many, many small, medium and large organizations as I've put up there. It's a decentralized approach. It's an approach inspired by Gandhiji, who said that really what we need to do is to jumpstart and stimulate local economies and build on people's local strengths and skills. And so we have more than 3,000 small, medium, and large, some of them quite large organizations. And I'll be speaking to this a little later. Through working with women, we realize that work is central to their being. They said, quite simply, if we work, we survive. We can feed our children. And so slowly, the path became clearer to us, and our goals became clearer, working shoulder to shoulder with our sisters. And here's what we have come up with 40 plus years ago, that if we want to move women towards self-reliance, if we want to work for their economic empowerment, then really work has to be central. But it's not just work. It's what we call full employment at the household level, not at the macro level, as economists say, but at the household level so that women and their families have basic work security and income security, as you can see up there, food security and social security. And in our experience, it's not just work and livelihoods. But if a woman is constantly taking her child to the doctor, if she has nowhere to take her child when she goes to the field and has to carry the child on hip, then it's very hard for her to earn and come out of poverty. All these ideas, perhaps as I keep saying, seem now quite commonplace. But 43 years ago, it wasn't. But I must also say that we still continue with the struggle of concepts, as we call it. The struggle of the idea that poor women, women at the grassroots themselves, can come together, find their own solutions, and move towards self-reliance, and need these basic services. I remember talking to a policy maker about 30 years ago when I first joined about the importance of childcare, that if there's one thing we want to do for women's economic empowerment is organize daycare, childcare. A whole lot of uh, sort of virtuous cycle uh, takes place when we do this. For example, we found 70% of girls entered school for the first time when their mothers had daycare for their younger brothers and sisters. Secondly, more than 50% income increase. Look what happened to women's earnings when women go out to work if daycare is organized, and I could go on. I think the most important lesson we've learned is that women can't do this alone. Indeed, none of us can do all of this alone, but more so for poor women. It's very difficult for them to confront an unfair employer, a usurious money lender, or even a corrupt local official until they come together and build their solidarity and sisterhood and speak in one voice. And that's really perhaps the biggest finding we've, we've come up with uh, in the last 40 years. And let me give you some examples of these membership-based organizations which have built women's solidarity and sisterhood. You can see some are quite small. They are not big, like uh, big businesses, but they certainly are pumping money into the local economy and helping me, women move forward. Our largest organization apart from Seva is Seva Bank. 4,000 women, mostly street vendors from the city of Ahmedabad, came together. Each of them paid 10 rupees 
which was their daily wage at that time, and with 40,000 rupees share capital, uh, Seva Bank was registered. Of course, it's a long story. It was not that easy at all, full of challenges. The RBI registrar who was about to give the license took one look at this ragtag bunch of women and said, this is a suicidal operation. But 40 years later, we have about half a million depositors, and as you can see, a fair amount of working capital, although of course we have a long, long way to go and are in the process of converting ourselves into a national bank as well. I think after Save Our Bank, our first cooperative, the next was several artisan cooperatives and dairy cooperatives, which I'll speak to later. And they are all in Gujarat in a federation of 106 cooperatives, as you can see there. The National Insurance Vimo Seva Cooperative, of which I'm the chairperson, uh, is our first national cooperative with women who are shareholders from five states. And we still, you know, have just insured a lack. We need to go much, much bigger than that, of course. But again, a lot of these organizations were formed because when women went to mainstream institutions, when our sisters like Chanda Ben and Suman Ben banged on the doors of the banks 40 years ago, they were shown the door. They were told women are not bankable. About 25 years ago, when we banged on the doors of the national insurance companies, they said, oh, poor women, you're bad risk. And we tried to explain to them, that's why we're here. Our lives are full of risk, repeated risk, frequent risk. And frequently, it's the poorest and the most marginalized women, widows, deserted women, who are always at risk, but no. So since no one would have us, often we had to invent our own, and that was certainly the case for Seva Bank and our insurance cooperative, which is perhaps India's first women-owned insurance cooperative. Gujarat is known for its Amul, the dairy movement, but there again, agenda bias. We found that it's the women who do all the work with buffaloes and cows, from cleaning the stable to getting their fodder to milking them and so on. But when it comes to decision making and control, when it comes to pricing, when it comes to uh, taking control of the income, it was always the men of the family. And that's when we, to their credit, the Amul, uh, Dr. Kurian at the time, to his credit, uh, really was open to this. So there's 60 women-owned dairy cooperatives, women-only dairy cooperatives now as part of the Gujarat dairy movement. Health cooperatives, um, Again, when we went to the registrar, he took one look at us and said, what are you going to manufacture? What are you going to produce? And we said, we'll be producing health services. Remember, 40 years ago, the government did not have the national health mission and such an emphasis on primary health care. So again, we had to invent our own. We trained our own sisters. In fact, Raji Ben, who I showed you in the first slide, is one such health worker. We trained them to be the barefoot doctors of their villages. And today, we have a modest turnover. We run four low-cost pharmacies. And through that, through the profits of that, we reach out to young people and speak about reproductive health, know your body, and so on. Our newest cooperative, and that's why I put it there, to show that everything has small beginnings is a tribal women's cooperative in South Gujarat in the interior district of Tapi district with just over 400 small farmers, all tribal women. But they've already in one year broken even. They got a seed license from the government when they came together. They're beginning to see, sell better seeds to each other and making a small profit. At least they've broken even at this time. I want to spend the last part of my talk talking about some of what we learned, because that's really why I'm here. And of course, it's an ongoing process of learning. But the first thing we found is what I've been saying all along, is that really alone, these women, perhaps none of us can do it. But when they come together, something powerful happens. So they find collective strength, solidarity. They find the strength to confront, as I've already said, and resist even access different programs, even sometimes confront their husbands and elders. I have a small incident to share with you, a very conservative community in North Gujarat called the Ahir community, where the women are exquisite embroiderers. The men folk said, you will not go from Radhanpur to Ahmedabad. If you go, there'll be a 10,000 rupee fine levied on each family. And the women collectively found the strength to resist. They confronted their elders and said, will you give us our rosy roti, our daily bread? 
and off they went to Ahmedabad and from then to Delhi and some of them went to the fashion shows of New York and Paris as well. So they traveled a long way. The second is the bargaining power increases. Um, I want to just mention a very well-known struggle, maybe some of you know, some of you don't know about the Manik Chowk street vendors who were regularly harassed and bullied in the main market of Ahmedabad by the police and the municipality. In fact, one policeman was even running a restaurant from all the uh, potatoes and onions he had confiscated from the women. But when they came together, not only could they put a case in the Supreme Court, which gave a ruling way back in 84, that women like them have the right to livelihood. But in 2014, as many of you know, a historic landmark law was passed in Parliament protecting the rights of street vendors. The other problem that all of you would be familiar with is that we have several government programs and policies, but they simply don't reach. I've already told you that many of the women in the absence to fill the void, if you will, invented their own bank, their own insurance, their own health cooperative. And not only do they get the services at their doorstep, but they also get employment from it. My colleague Asha Ben is a ready-made garment worker, but today she's earning 10,000 rupees as an insurance agent for Vimo Seva. Like all of us, when we come together in these forums, we learn new ideas, approaches, strategies, hone our skills. We learn from each other. We learn by observation. We learn by doing. I think the very important contribution, if I may say so, is how women have developed as leaders and managers. Because you need leaders and managers to run all these small, little, little organizations at the decentralized level. So thousands and thousands of women have been thrown up as strong leaders. Many of them are then invited to be on their panchayats and other local committees. Another important thing is for the first time, these women are able to link with the outside world. They come out of the four walls of their home. And it's also easier for government and private organizations to link with them because now there is a platform, there's actually an organization to link with. And then, of course, importantly, that's the whole point. They become self-reliant individually and also collectively, both financially and in terms of decision making and control. I think one of the things we've seen is that people, again, speaking of body language from this kind of approach, begin to walk erect, look people in the eye, feel more confident, and lead their own communities. Also because, in addition to the money that they're pump pumping into the local economy, they're pumping new ideas of leadership and governance. As I said, they serve on local committees like health committees and so on, which both generate demand and accountability. And I'm sure other colleagues who are working at the grassroots here will also testify to this.